In this small example, we got just five nodes. So five nodes labeled as one to up to five, and they're all together ten possible sessions. Okay, let's say a oh, session between one and two, one and three, one and four, one and five, then session between two and three, going through this path. Right, two and four, and two and five, and so on. There are altogether ten possible sessions among these five nodes, and there are five links, bi-directional links. And we can look at the degree distribution here. The degree distribution for this graph is very simple: is three, two, 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 one. Okay. Of course, this is extremely small example to illustrate our point. But this enables us to write the matrices and optimization on a single slide. All right, so let's look at call this graph G one. Okay. Let's look at S of G one and P of G one. The small S of G one is easy to compute because the sum of the DIDJs for all the IJs that are connected. For example, nodes one, two are connected, so the first term is d1 plus d2, and they're all together five terms here: d1 plus d3 plus d1 plus d5 plus d2 plus times d4 plus d3 plus d4. Okay, it's all associated with the left graph. We'll talk about the right graph in a minute. So you can add this up. For example, the first term is three times two, okay, with all the terms, and then you get a number twenty-three. Okay. Now, how do we find the big S of G one? We need to know what kind of graph with a no degree distribution of three two 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 one would give you the largest small S. Well, if you look at all these terms, you see that the best way to do that is to make a simple swap. Okay, instead of three connect to four and one connect to five, one should connect to four because then we get a term of three multiply two instead of three multiply one. Okay, so switch one to five to one to four, and then switch three to four to three to five. You can verify that in this right-hand graph G two called, it has the exact same no degree distribution three two 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 one. Again, it's not exactly Pareto, but it suffices to illustrate our point of trade-off between S of G and P of G. And then you can carry out the computation for small S of G two is twenty four. And therefore, big S of G one is is small s divided by the maximum s you can get out of all the graphs with this degree distribution, which is twenty four. So it's twenty three out of twenty four. And clearly, big S of G two is twenty four out of twenty four is one. So one is uh, less than one; the other is one. Therefore, this graph G one is less likely to be drawn at random. Than G two, just like internet is less likely to be drawn、uh, than preferential attachment type of topology. So now the question is, what about performance? P of G one and P of G two. Let's run this exercise for P of G one. P of G two is very similar. Okay, okay. So we just calculated the likelihood already. Now here's the performance. So first of all. We have to write down this routing matrix R, which is five by ten because there are ten possible sessions. Okay, and the variables is basically x one, x two, da da da, down to x ten. And there are five ah、uh, uh, links, ah、uh, five nodes here. Okay, so R is five by ten. Let's say the first ah、uh, session. Is the session of session one? It's the session that goes from node one to node two, and therefore is simply one one zero 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 is this column because the first session、uh, goes through 
uh, nodes one and two and no other nodes. Okay. And the second session, which is, uh, let's say, one goes to three, again, it's very simple. It's just one, zero, one, zero, zero now. And you can fill out the rest of this routing matrix. Okay. The next session is one, one, zero, one, zero. It's one to four. And then it will be one to five, which is one, zero, 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 one, because one is directly connected to five. And then it's the session two to three now. Okay. We'll see that in order for two to go to three, you'll pass through uh, node one. So this session, the fifth column, is the session number five, going from node two to node three. And the path will traverse the following three nodes, one, one, the first three nodes, one, two, three. So the uh, entries in this column is one, 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 zero, zero. So you can fill out the rest. And now, with this routing matrix constructed, we say this matrix multiply our variable should be less than the total bandwidth available per router and out of these five nodes. Let's say the B case are exactly the same as their degree. They don't have to be just to make the number simpler. And therefore, they are three, two, 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 one, basically. So the total bandwidth number of packets can process is just uh, is directly proportional uh, to their node degrees. So per degree, basically assuming has a unit capacity of processing. So subject to this constraint, okay, and the definition that each x is really rho times the demand and the supply. So we can uh, make up some data for these y values. Okay, for example, we can just say the y vector is five, two, four, four, two, and therefore for each session, there are ten of them. You can look at what are the sources and destination, multiply the number, and then you get another constraint. So constraint one, constraint two, subject to these two constraints maximize the summation of xi. That's the objective function for performance. Now, if you solve this very simple linear optimization problem, you get the following answer. The following answer, x star is some vector actually doesn't matter. Rho star actually doesn't matter. It turns out to be 0 0.033. But that's not the key. The key is that the maximize the sum of these end-to-end -end sessions throughput that is, the performance for this graph G1 is 3.73 certain unit, let's say, gigabits per second. Now we can carry out the exact same procedure for this graph G2. Okay. And then you're going to get a different number. It turns out that the performance for G2 graph is 3.03 gigabit per second, which is clearly smaller than 3.73 significantly. And the reason is quite clear, because in order to make the most highly connected node to be sort of in the center of this very small graph, you're actually creating a performance bottleneck in supporting throughput. So now if I plot the location of G1, G2 in the P performance versus S likelihood, normalized likelihood graph, I see that they follow the same trend as the internet versus preferential attachment, except this is a much, much smaller example. So we get a very small dynamic range, but nonetheless, you see the qualitative trade-off between performance and likelihood. So that is our small example, and we are going to conclude this part of the lecture. In the advanced material, we'll say a lot more about both preferential attachment and constraint optimization as generative models of scale-free networks. 
and there's a very rich and interesting background. The history goes all the way back to Zips, and then to Pareto and Yuli, who basically discovered that for many phenomena, whether it's the size of the city or the frequency of appearance of words in languages, many distributions, the kth most popular um, by histogram tallying item often shows up with a frequency that is 1 over k. Now clearly that is our scale-free phenomenon. It doesn't matter what k is, the chance of it shows up is 1 over k. So there's no specific characteristic scale just like Pareto distribution. As you can see Pareto here in the history of this uh, evolution. And then back in the 1950s there was this debate to say all these are observations. The question is how do you explain the observation? And there was a debate between Mandelbrot and Simon. And that debate is very similar to the debate about 10 years ago in early 2000 between preferential attachment and constraint optimization, except the context, of course, in 1950s was not the internet router topology. And very briefly speaking, before going to advanced material, preferential attachment says that when new nodes are added to a graph, they are more likely to be connected to those with a lot of connections already. So the rich gets richer, more connected gets even more connected. Conceptually, it says that the self-organizing growth mechanism of a graph leads to power law distribution. And mathematically, it says, turns out that sampling by density leads to a difference equation. We'll see the advanced material whose solution gives you equilibrium that satisfies a power law. In contrast, Constraint optimization generates power law distribution in a very different way. It says that the graph topology is really designed with some objective functions and some constraints in mind, and yet the resulting topology can also show power law. Conceptually, it says that power law is the natural outcome of constraint optimization with objective driven by economics, for example, and constraints driven by technology. Mathematically, it says that either entropy maximization or what's called isoelastic utility maximization under linear constraints. We're going to see this in the advanced material part of the video for this lecture. Either of them, among many others, would give rise to a power law. So there lies the main differences between preferential attachment and constraint optimization. So the question is, which one to use? Well, it depends on which one gives you the predictive power that you need on other properties. Not the power law distribution anymore because they both generate that. Other properties of the graph, such as robustness to a target attack of highly connected nodes. Will that break the network? Will that break just the edge? Whichever generate model can also have a predictive power on other properties that you care about should be the one that you use. And there lies an interesting story on the pitfall of generative models. In 2000, there was so much talk about the Internet having an Achilles heel. It turns out that if you look at empirical data, you go talk to AT&T or Cisco Juniper, you realize that that's just not supported by factual data. It highlights the importance of falsification of any self-consistent theory through empirical data of the field that you are talking about. It also highlights the risk of overgeneralizing something called a network science, which is a fuzzy and mostly uh, meaningless term, unless you provide some concrete meaning to it. By overgeneralizing it to some universally true property, it actually loses domain-specific functionality models and thereby often loses predictive power and even lead to confusing misleading conclusions, such as the uh, non-existence of this Achilles hues. So we have seen generative models, reverse engineering of network topology, small worlds, and scale-free. 
And later, we will also look at reverse engineering of network protocols. We have also seen the interplay between topology, say a graph and the corresponding matrices, versus functionalities, whether that's navigation or search, routing, or robustness to specific kind of attacks. And the interplay between these two dimensions of what we call a network, whether social, economic, or tech network, will continue to show up in the rest of the course. As we conclude this point, the midpoint of this 20 questions about our network life.